Welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Phoebe Tucker. I'm a nature associate at the Green Finance Institute. And today we are going to be talking about developing legal contracts in closing. This is our eighth and final webinar in the GFI investment readiness series that we've been running for almost a year to the day. So looking at the attendee list, uh, I can see a lot of people have been with these webinars throughout. So I just wanted to say a very quick thank you for joining contributing and supporting this really interesting discussion on how projects can reach a stage of investment readiness. And I'll say a few words at the end uh, about where the GFI webinars will go from here. But drawing back to today, we're here to explore how project developers can build legal contracts that are fit for purpose. Now, in the toolkit, we made this decision to put this milestone at the very end of the toolkit journey because we've heard from a number of project developers how you can secure legal advice on any number of things throughout your project's journey, which is great. But legal, uh, developing legal contracts in earnest is very different. And what you ideally want to do is get as many people in the tent as possible, clarify how things are going to work in the project, and then get to a point where you are ready to turn all of that into a legally binding agreement. And so we put this milestone right at the end. We're very happy to be joined by three excellent panelists today who can tell you all about this experience in practice and what their insight is from what they've learned. Our three speakers today will be uh, Sarah Brownlee, Head of Development at Wilder Carbon, Glenn Anderson, Project Lead at Wendling Beck, and Ross Fairley, Partner at Burgess Salmon. And so we've got three, uh, three panelists, two are project developers and one is a legal advisor, which I think will make for an excellent discussion. And I'm really looking forward to digging into this. Just a bit of housekeeping, though, before we kick off as normal. Uh, and most people will be familiar with this, but please do use the Q&A function throughout the webinar just to submit your questions as we go. And you can also use the chat function, which is enabled for everyone to add to. And actually, if you'd like to introduce yourself and say what you're here to learn, that would be great. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the GFI Toolkit and also our YouTube channel, where I think I have a link that I can post in a minute for all of the webinars we've run to date on this series. So if you've missed any before and you'd like to catch up on the series, then fear not, because all previous webinars and this webinar today are being made available for everyone to access. And so with that, I think we are ready to kick off our amazing panel discussion. And we are starting with Sarah Brownlee, who is head of development at Wilder Carbon, to talk through how Wilder Carbon Standard developed its contracts that the team are using to this day. So, Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, yeah, and just to extend thanks to the GFI team, because I know that a lot of people have really valued these webinars. It's really hard stuff to, to kind of unpick. Um, so, so thank you very much. <laughs> it's been really helpful. Um, so I have um, a few slides. I'm going to run through them uh, very quickly, but I'm happy to share the slides afterwards because there's um, hopefully some helpful text on them throughout. Um, so just to provide some context, um, our NERF project uh, was to develop uh, the standard, Wilder Carbon Standard, as it was known at the time, now uh, formerly Wilder Carbon Standard for Nature and Climate. Um, so we were actually developing um, a standard and carbon scheme, um, a mechanism for, for locking up additional carbon through nature restoration and reinstating natural processes um, at the same time as developing two pilot projects. Um, so we had to approach the development of our legal framework both from the perspective of the scheme manager as well as the project developer um, and helpfully I'm wearing two hats so uh, my, I have a role at Kent Wildlife Trust um, as well as a project manager for the Wilder Carbon Initiative. One of the pilot projects were, was with uh, Kent Wildlife Trust and the other with our partners Somerset Wildlife Trust um, so I can talk from many different perspectives. So just a very quick introduction um, of Wilder Carbon Standard. Um, as I mentioned, we've developed that mechanism and standard to uh, lock up additional carbon through nature restoration projects in the UK, um, a natural climate solution that assures high quality nature restoration projects that generate resilient carbon credits sold to buyers who can demonstrate a much broader strategy to reduce and remove carbon. Um, so it's about ensuring um, high integrity end to end. Um, our legal framework development process um, 
I say 10 months, but I think actually it <laughs> it was more like 18 months. Um, it, it was a very big part of the process of, of um, setting up the scheme and setting the, de- the, the projects up to, to begin delivery. Um, we had many stakeholders, um, including key stakeholders, as I mentioned, our project deliverers um, for the Honeygar pilot project, Somerset Wildlife Trust, and the Heather Corrie Bell um, pilot project with Kent Wildlife Trust. Um, and as you'll all know, it's not just the delivery teams that we were working to, um, it was also the trustee boards um, that we had to work with um, as part of this process of negotiating and developing these legal frameworks. We also had a um, of course, our buyers. Um, so um, I think at the time we we spoke to over 20 prospective buyers at a very early stage of Wilder Carbon's development. So it was a very hypothetical conversation. It was very difficult to kind of gauge um, what it might end up looking like. Um, but we got some really good insight from potential buyers about what the uh, buyer agreements would look like, which I'll come on to in more detail. So. Um, just a quick sort of uh, run through of what we wanted from our, our legal framework. Um, you can see here, this is, is kind of a very simple uh, image of, of what it consists of. So you've got Wilder Carbon Limited down here, um, which is actually the commercial entity. Um, we've got the approved buyers top right and our delivery partners. And this was a, a model that very much reflected the projects that we were working with at the time. We've now extended this out um, to fit private landowners in there um, with another kind of uh, <laughs> set of uh, agreements, which which uh, we're testing in practice now. Um, but what we wanted was uh, no direct contract between the delivery partner and the approved buyer. Uh, we wanted those obligations to be facilitated via Wilder Carbon Limited because we knew that we would be moving towards a model that would look at insurance um, and we wanted to be seen as an uh, assurance mechanism um, to provide uh, buffers and security around the transactions. Uh, We wanted agreements that aligned to the version of the standard Um, that was live at the date of signing um, and any changes to then be mutually applied um, and less legally enforced. So um, having sort of change clauses and the ability to kind of assess changes in the project, knowing that essentially nature is an uncontrollable uh, commodity, if you like. So we really wanted to enable um, the sort of wilding exploratory conservation practice to be supported by this legal, legal framework. Um, Liabilities are set out within the agreements um, in respect of non-delivery, so we really wanted to highlight the risks and obligations. What happens if it doesn't work? Um, Who is at risk and what do those risks look like? So we really wanted to be very, very clear um, that, of course, what we're dealing with through my narrow carbon perspective is voluntary action. Uh, These corporates that are buying carbon credits, um, it's voluntary action in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, And so ultimately we really wanted to highlight that buyer risk element um, and what happens if, 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 the units don't uh, sort of materialize. And so we put lots of remedies, risk mitigations, um, and this is what happens in worst case scenario within the contracts and the terms and conditions. Um, Of course, we wanted our management agreements to be set over 50 years in alignment with the standard. um, And uh, we wanted SOWS agreements that were set apart from the management agreements um, that enabled Wilder Carbon to promote, sell, manage and retire the use of units um, for a five year period so that it didn't leave the the deliverers um, sort of hanging if for any reason Wilder Carbon Limited didn't uh, continue that role of uh, a broker in the SOWS in the future and it could open it up to other parties. So it was really about future proofing, safeguarding the standard and the mechanism, as well as the projects and their delivery. Um, Just a bit about the flow of money. Um, So when you're considering your legal contracts, we also had to get advice from VAT experts, tax experts, um, auditors, um, to make sure that actually the the financial mechanisms that came through the legal framework um, were appropriate and supported um, and that we had considered everything. So just for uh, confirmation, the money exchange goes from the buyer to the delivery partner and Wilder Carbon Limited will then 
request uh, the sales fees post sale. Um, so we invoice the, the, the deliverer directly. Um, and what we do is also require the buyer to pay fees um, to, in, in order for us to continue to monitor their efforts of their carbon reduction. So, um, as I mentioned, lengthy process, lots of stakeholders, um, and it included a lot of um, sort of really specific detail. Um, so things, as I mentioned, like splitting out the management of the project and the sale of the units into separate contracts and agreements um, and terms and conditions for, for World of Carbon Limited to, to manage that sale. Um, we also, that took a lot of agreement around the kind of sales relationship. Um, what we wanted to do was ensure that there was no uh, deemed transfer of asset from the delivery partners to Wilder Carbon. We purely wanted to act as, uh, as the representative um, selling and managing those, those units. Um, we know that um, asset ownership is really important for, for landowners, especially charities who have an obligation to manage those appropriately, not undervalue them, et cetera, et cetera. So we really wanted to encapsulate all of that into the agreements. We also, again, from, from a, through a future proofing lens, wanted to make sure that um, change of controls were considered. So what happens if the person owning the land wants to sell it in disposals? What happens if Wilder Carbon Limited um, is, is uh, it folds or we can't, we can no longer um, sort of support the scheme? We wanted to put lots of security around that. So that was all considered. Um, and lots of things like remedy clauses. What happens if it doesn't work? Practicality checks, um, because there's all of the, 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 the legal stuff, which is really important, um, but it's all, it, it, needs to it needs to work in practice. It needs to be clear um, and it needs, obligations need to be set out appropriately. So um, it was uh, considering all of those. Um, and I'm going to skip forward uh, again, uh, mention of the tax and auditors, um, you know, just considering roles and responsibilities was really important. Uh, tax implications, how best to sort of set up the business models, who would be doing what um, in a view of your, your legal framework um, and making sure that you're not doing things like charging back on carbon because that's not uh, currently supported. So do consider uh, tax and auditing implications. Um, and I really wanted to focus on the lessons that we learned. Um, again, from my very narrow carbon perspective, you know, we, I hope that these will be helpful across, you know, all, all kind of natural capital schemes. Um, but I think, as Phoebe said at the beginning there, it was really important that we agreed clear principles as early as possible. So the real kind of hard lines, <laughs> these are no-goes for us. These are things that we really absolutely want to make sure are in the legal agreements. If you can set out those clear principles, it will help in your negotiations between parties and it will also help in your communication with your legal partner being really clear what it is that you want to achieve because you can ask them to provide you with a quote for a scope of work but if you've got that clarity and agreement at the beginning of these these hard line principles it really does help that process um, so be sure to do that um, likewise you know a next step of having formal heads of terms written up um, to make sure that again you've got those kind of um, hard lines agreed um, at an early stage of, of the process before full contracts are, are drawn up. There's no surprises um, and it doesn't extend the process unnecessarily. Um, this might seem really silly, but this was the bane of my life. Version control, version control. Agree the development process for your legal framework and who's going to do what bit. Organize um, the process so you know um, what versions you're working with and when, especially when you're dealing with a multi-stakeholder um, development process It's uh, and different entities want different things version control, come up with a system that works for you, communicate that system. It's it's really important. I know a silly thing, but um, it, it will become a problem if, if you haven't got something in place to manage that. And roles and responsibilities as well, really understanding, um, oops, sorry, uh, <laughs> who is doing what, um, both in terms of the development process, but also in terms of the legal roles and responsibilities as well. Um, 
when you start to put, and I'm going to skip down to this bullet point here, definitions of who is doing what. Um, and these definitions, this table of definitions is your is your Bible. Um, and as soon as all parties understand the language that is going to be used, again, the easier the negotiations will become. Um, we found that uh, quite a lot of the time, we um, we may have felt frustrated because we felt like we were saying the same, we were probably saying the same thing, but we were using different language. Um, and I think things like just understanding definitions, especially if your legal partner hasn't operated in this space, you know, providing um, clear definitions of, uh, of the natural capital that you're working with. So what is carbon? What is the buyer actually buying? You know, is it is it the asset? No, it's the use of the data. So the this then puts it in a really clear perspective for the legal partner to be able to go, okay, this legal term applies to the use of data, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been really clear about what your product is, how you want to sell it, who owns it, and how that transfer and use is going to take place is really important. So definitions are as important as your as your principles to, to kind of agree and clarify early on um, again you know hardwire to explore change these are very long contracts um, that we're all going to be working with so there are fundamentals that you will need to keep fixed as possible um, but uh, with the length of the project you need change clauses um, uh, uh, I can't remember what we called them in house. <laughs> my mind has gone blank uh, but we had um, a clause that that could can that basically allowed everybody to take a pause and, and reflect on how things had gone so far and for the party to basically say we, we want to change something you know it's not because of an issue but actually times have moved on and we think actually this would work much better for us so really just making the contracts reasonable um, to allow you to enter into exploratory discussions um, which is kind of a gray area from a legal perspective but having that um, sort of facilitative um, element within your legal frameworks is really important because this space is developing at such a pace so it needs to be it needs to be captured and change needs to be accepted as something that could happen later on um, again I've mentioned this before but capturing the essence of the intended action so for carbon for example it's voluntary action um, and we wanted to make sure that that narrative around what we were all intending to do the landowner the the, the world of carbon the scheme and also the buyer wanted to ultimately see action for nature and climate um, and all of the stuff surrounding that. So really kind of capturing the essence of what it is that you're trying to achieve together, um, put that as part of your principles as well. And test as well. Don't be afraid to challenge your legal partners. Ross is gonna talk in a moment. We worked with Ross um, and uh, purchase salmon because of their experience in this sector. We also worked with Anthony Collins, who didn't have experience in the carbon space, but had worked with us on many uh, nature-based uh, nature based projects. Um, and so having uh, Ross with that carbon sector expertise was really, really helpful. But we did test um, models that he'd used with other schemes because we wanted to make things slightly different. Don't be afraid to challenge them with real life practical examples. So um, what happens then if, if, if the buyer says this or does this, how will that work? We're not sure we want it to work that way. Can we have it working this way? And you'll find that legal partners will then go away and find something that fits. So don't be afraid to test um, test your legal partners um, to make the legal contracts really fit what it is that you're trying to do. Don't feel that you have to slot into um, sort of existing constructs. Um, they're very receptive and very helpful um, and it really does help um, to test the contracts in practice um, from the project deliverer perspective as well as the buyers. Um, so I'm going to finish there. Um, I hope that was helpful, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. There was so much around all of this stuff. It's really hard to kind of pick out specifics, but I feel like those were key things that, that kept coming up time and time again that I just wanted to kind of raise flags on. <laughs> No, Sarah, that was brilliant. What a great overview of the process and the learnings. And I think we have had a couple of questions in the chat and uh, in the Q&A, which we can come back to later. But uh, maybe I'll just use this moment to clarify, because there's a question from Tom 
in the chat to say, um, do you now have template agreements? And I understand yeah. that you put this work in to really develop these contract templates for further use. And yeah. although you're going to iterate on these and build on them, um, that was the goal to come out of this process with templates that can be reused. Just wanted to clarify yeah. that. Absolutely. So our process was very extensive because we knew we wanted a template and we knew we wanted to make them public um, so that it just provided transparency around um, really from the buyer perspective, they can see what we'd agreed with the with the, the project deliverer. So they know what the project deliverer um, and their obligations are. And likewise, the project deliverer can see what our buyers are held to. So we really wanted to um, provide that transparency. And we were warned of it. Um, and these contracts did cost a lot of money, but we feel like they're really useful assets to our business model to, for them to be public. So you can go on the website, you can see the management agreements, um, you, as well as the project design documents for the projects and all of the other relating uh, documents, um, like our uh, validation statement when uh, they're validated from our partners soil association certification um, so that's all public and also the buyer side our terms and conditions are public so any buyer can go and see exactly what they're purchasing um, and what the risks are um, and they can also see the approved buyer agreements which is about us then going and, and monitoring their reduction action over time and holding up their end of the bargain to, to reduce emissions as well as purchasing carbon credits uh, to offset that residual so yes they're all available um, on the website I can share links <laughs> Brilliant, Sarah. Thank you. I've just been trying to find the the, oh. the links, and I think I captured one of them. But yeah, thank if you. you. Yeah, I'll follow up with the the links, others. That would be great. No, thank you so much. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, we have Glenn Anderson of the Wendling Beck, uh, who is a farmer, um, one of the original founding partners of the Wendling Beck, to give his perspective on how he's been exploring contracts uh, in his project. Glenn, over to you. Thank you. Can you see my screen okay? Let me know when that comes up. Yep, yeah, brilliant. Just, we see I'm just it in, in... A... Okay. Yeah, I'll, yes. I'll give you a brief, a brief overview of uh, the sort of the journey that we've come on. But Wendling Beck is probably four years into the making now. Um, and it's it's been um, quite a complex journey in lots of ways. And the project is a, a collaboration um, amongst a number of landowners, so four farmers, Norfolk Wildlife Trust and Norfolk County Council, and then supported by various different NGOs and um, sort of private sector organisations. And it's it's a project that will transition um, a couple of thousand acres over time from um, intensive arable into habitat creation and nature restoration. And out of that will come a, a revenue stream from various different ecosystem services. So that's a, a map of the project as it was three years ago before we started. So you can see the, the map in the top left hand corner is a UK hab map with the orange being um, arable production. Um, a kind of a, a river spine down the middle of the project, which is the Wendenbeck River, which is where the project gets its name, which is just a little chalk stream. And over time, it will transition into something um, much more wild. It's not a rewilding project. It's kind of managed conservation. Um, and we're, we're, we're managing that in a way which has predetermined outcomes. So the, the ecosystem services that we're looking at are, are principally biodiversity net gain, um, but also looking at nutrient mitigation, and we're not 100% sure where, where we stand on that at the moment with all the um, sort of going to go into um, on with uh, nutrient neutrality at the moment, um, but then also some natural flood management. Um, we are measuring the carbon within this project um, with a view to seeing where the carbon market goes to and how the stacking and bundling rules, which is the other thing to sort of be aware of on this. Um, and then there's a there's a few sort of other ecosystem services in here as well, um, which which we potentially could monetize in the future. So you can see that the map on the the top left hand side there is a sort of changed color. That's um, various different um, habitat types being created, but quite grassland um, dominated as part of the process. So that's that's where we're heading. Um, a big part of this um, legal piece for us was actually setting up the operating company to be able to 
um, manage the project over the long term. So all of these projects are, are long term projects. If you're looking at compliance markets like biodiversity net gain, there's sort of a minimum 30 year agreement in there. But really, as you as you're transitioning these landscapes, you have to have a kind of an in perpetuity model. So as we go through this thought process, particularly um, with the private landowners in this project, there's there's a huge amount of consideration around tax and sort of legacy planning and sort of generational planning. And the starting point for that is is really this kind of corporate body and... Um, oh, Glenn, sorry to interrupt you uh, mid midstream, but I think uh, we're still seeing the first slide. Uh, I think if you click on the, the, the left-hand side, I believe. That moved or not? No, not quite. Uh, we're still we're on the holding slide now and we can see the the other slides in presentation. Okay, let me I'll tell you what I'll do. I think. Let me just stop sharing. I think it's because I've got another screen plugged in as well. Let me start sharing again. Is that better? Uh, still the holding slide, actually. Uh, oh yes, now we see it. Brilliant. Thank you, Glenn. Okay. Please continue. Oh, sorry, these are the these are the ones you missed. So that was the project three years ago. So you can see that it's if you look at that UK head map in the top left, pretty much um, um, arable for the majority, and then we will go forward to a a kind of a transitioned landscape, much wilder landscape with a with a quite a complex mosaic of different habitat types, but mainly grass based within there. And then this is the, the important one for you, which is that operating company structure. So um, as we've gone through this process, it's taken us probably 18 months to get to this point. We've looked at various different um, corporate models within this, so a, a, a joint corporate body or a joint venture. Um, and we're reliant on um, you know, existing corporate structures to be able to, to deliver something there. So we've actually gone for a limited liability partnership. I think we described that as the least worst option for the project. Um, and part of the complexity in that is around tax, um, both from an income tax point of view, making sure that people aren't going to get double taxed as farmers and landowners. We have different um, existing corporate structures as well. So we've got partnerships and limited companies, investment companies and trading companies. And that that really kind of complicates the picture here. And quite a lot of this um, legal work has been dovetailing in with tax advisors to, to try and um, give us a model that will work for everybody in the future. But then, as, as Sarah um, sort of alluded to within her contracts, really trying to understand, you know, what if, what if this happens in the future? What if that happens in the future? And making sure that we're not sort of tying up um, future generations and allowing um you know people to sell land if they need to or um you know sell other you know entire farm assets and and bring other people into that structure over time if if that's a requirement because we don't know what's going to happen in the future we're, we're working on a, a, a on a in perpetuity model in some ways and we need to allow enough flexibility in that process and i think that was partly why we went for a limited liability partnership because it gave us that inherent flexibility to be able to change um, the the kind of the governing um, structure within that and that's important as you get through to the the contractual side because a, a lot of the the kind of the the legal effort in this is actually um, tied up within the um, limited liability partnership agreement in this um, instance and that, that allows you a smoother transactional process as you get through to the um, the contracts that bind these ecosystem services. So I'll flick through this really quickly, but this is just a, a table which shows you the kind of the pros and cons of all of the different kind of corporate structures that um, we have available to us. So, you know, basic private limited company, LLP, community interest companies, charitable company, co-op, other, other principal ones. And... The, this is kind of written from a landowner's perspective. So what are the pros and cons around tax, you know, um, access to money, being able to, to um, use some of that um, early um, income as sort of working capital and um, 
not tying ourselves up in knots um, where if you're trying to, you know, if you have a habitat failure or something like that and you need to reinvest, you, you know, you need access to some of that um, early money from the contract. So there's a there's a kind of a, an operating company piece. We then have a, um, you know, a, a binding contract for the different ecosystem services. And then there's a financial piece to this. So we're trying to, to ring fence a pot of money, which makes sure that it's there for future generations and people to be able to deliver the project over the, the time within the contract, which for biodiversity net gain would be 30 years for neutral neutrality. It might be 125 years. So these are really long terms. They go way past my tenure. So I'm as I'm doing this as a lander and I'm thinking about, you know, what if for the next generation and, and making sure that there's an ex, uh, enough flexibility in um, that process. And Ross might have some, some ideas and comments on that as well. Um, the other side to this is really the, the kind of the management and the um, monitoring and measurement of this. So as we look forward to the contractual piece of this, um, how often is this being measured? Who's who's our responsible body? What are our um, legal obligations in that respect that go alongside these contracts? And you know we're doing stuff beyond the requirements of the policy for biodiversity net gain because we want to kind of um, use this as an exemplar project to to study kind of species recovery as we go forward. But actually, a lot of that effort and a lot of that work can start to form some of the compliance requirements within the contracts as well. So at a, a contractual level, and it's, it's a difficult one to, to create a slide for, so I'll just go on to the last one there. But um, we're looking at various different mechanisms. So for biodiversity net gain, we have a couple of options, which is a conservation covenant, um, which is a new law came in on the 1st of October last year. Um, and that was really designed to, um, it's the first time in, in UK law, we've actually had a, a positive covenant. So within land law, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm sort of on slightly shaky ground here, but you, you have lots of restrictive covenants and we're, we're kind of used to the, those and any landowners on here will probably be aware of, of kind of restrictive covenants on their land that says you, you can't do this and you can't do that. This is the first time we've had a positive covenant in law which says you must do this and you must do that. So you must manage the land in that way. And the benefit of that is that because these are long term agreements, as that land might change hands over the over that time, it binds the incoming landowner into those actions as well. So whether that's managing a, a piece of habitat in a certain way to a certain habitat management plan or whatever that might be. Um, the issue with conservation covenants is they're a new law and law tends to work on what's happened before and, and um, case law and lawyers generally, Ross might correct me if I'm wrong, but generally don't are, are kind of nervous about um, new legal mechanisms which haven't been tried and tested. So um, where we stand today, um, conservation covenants are within the remit of the law, but they are a binding agreement between a responsible body and the landowner. Now, from Wendling Beck's point of view, that presents one difficulty in that we are a, a, a group of joint landowners under a corporate entity, and that's why this dovetails into the contractual piece. Um, but the binding agreement has to be with the individual landowners and we're not transferring the land into the opco the land sits with the individual landowners so that presents one slight issue that we're, we're still not quite sure ex exactly how we're over going to overcome um the other issue with conservation covenants is we haven't actually got any responsible bodies at the moment because the guidance was only um, brought out a few weeks ago and people are still digesting that and trying to get their heads around it and obviously you know, if you're going to have a contract between two parties, you need one of those parties to exist to be able to execute that. So over time, as um, the responsible bodies um, start to emerge, whoever they might be, it might be um, the wildlife trusts, it could be um, local authorities, which is probably the most um, likely um, example, and that could be a kind of a local, local planning authority level, or it might be county councils. Um, they're going to re be responsible for monitoring and measuring and, and the compliance piece of these contracts as you go forward. And we really need to understand what that looks like as well, because we haven't got um, visibility of what those costs are going to be. You know, How often are they going to come and inspect this? Is that a full baseline survey every time, which is going to be very expensive? Is it a light touch? Are they using remote sensing? We haven't got all of those answers yet. 
Um, so there's a there's a little way to go on conservation covenants, in my opinion. Um, the other mechanism that we've got is a Section 106 agreement, which is obviously well tried and tested. And with the early um, contracts that we're looking at, we're actually going down that route because, um, well, it's because it's the only one that we've got at the moment. And, um, you know, people are familiar with them. So that that's um, where we're heading. And, you know, there's lots of, of templates. If you go on Google, you can find multiple sort of templates for, for Section 106 agreements. And there are a few out there specifically for um biodiversity net gain as well so that gives us um a tool in the box that we can use early doors um we then have sort of we're in a slightly strange position at the moment because we're technically in um a time of voluntary net gain so until we get mandatory net gain which was due to be november until this morning um we're we're in a slightly weird position so where we've got contracts that are going through at the moment um, we're very nervous that actually they might end up as quite difficult um, legacy 106 agreements, which won't go on to the digital register, which is part of that policy and will make life um, slightly complicated. So we're trying to hold back a little bit on any of those voluntary agreements to try and get the policy out there to mandatory to bring it all in line. As we're, as we're kind of approaching this from a a practical point of view on the ground the other issue that we've got is the the cost of this and um the way that biodiversity net game works is means that there will be quite a few transactions for small amounts of units because um you know you probably end up with quite a lot of developers that are looking for one unit or half a unit or something like that now that creates a problem if you're going to do a section 106 agreement for every single one of those because um it's, it's quite expensive and it becomes quite complex to manage and we're also not quite sure what the monitoring requirements of that need to be so we're, what we're trying to do is overarching 106 agreements where we take a parcel a bigger parcel of land with multiple units on it that are bound under the 106 and then you can draw down the biodiversity units from from that contract over time that has the benefit that it has a single monitoring um process to it so with probably with one organization because it's it's just one contract at that point the risk of that is you might not sell all of the units within that parcel of land so you have to do it in kind of bite-sized um, pieces so that's that's caused a bit of angst in the process as well um, the other option that you do have is just private treaty so if, if it is a voluntary agreement um, and we have got one of these that's going through it's just a, a, a private contract and obviously contracts are, are, are well known um, within the legal um, framework so it's easy to to say you know we will do this you will do that and, and create a contract out of that but um, really the, the the bread and butter of this for us is going to rest short term with section 106 agreements longer term hopefully with conservation covenants and that will that will bind anything biodiversity net gain related and anything nutrient neutrality related assuming that policy um survives um over the next few months so um that that kind of gives us a, a starting point from that point of view um just so i can see if there's anything on my Anything else on my list? Probably the, the 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 register for this is the other thing to be aware of um, because that does have a bearing on some of the, the the legal contracts as well and how it dovetails with the digital register as that emerges. So early doors, we haven't got all of the answers. Um, I think most people are making it up as they go along, but yeah, hopefully that's a useful overview and we can take any questions at the end. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Glenn. That was a uh such a I think I think what I took away from that is how the stuff on the ground particularly with the monitoring and things that uh you know how how the farmers are forming that limited uh liability partnership how that translates to impact on the use of contracts and the key considerations there so I, I thought that was brilliant and I know from earlier in the chat someone said that they wanted an overview of what kind of contracts are in play within the nature market space. So I hope that was useful in talking about um, Section 106 and conservation covenants. I thought I thought there's a lot to take away there. And um, just to note, we will be updating our legal contract section on the toolkit also with the latest views of 
these contracts because um, just having a list of the contract types and what they mean generally can be very useful to people in this space. So thank you, Glenn. Uh, so we're moving on to our final speaker, who is Ross Fairley, who is partner at uh, Burgess Salmon, and uh, really happy to be joined by Ross, who can give an overview from the legal advisor side uh, on what it's like to work with projects um, to develop these contracts. So over to you, Ross. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, thanks, Glenn. And thanks, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, just by way of introduction, I'm, I, I'm Ross. I head up what we call at Burgess Salmon our Net Zero Services for, for clients. You can probably see from behind me, actually, that I do a lot of renewable energy work uh, as well as this type of work. And I've been involved in, if you can call it nature-based solutions, widest nature-based solutions for, for many, many years, from the early days of going back 20 years ago when there were tree planting schemes put in place um, in the early days, um, carbon credits and so forth, right the way through um, to now. I obviously work with Sarah and Wilder Carbon. Um, we've been working with commercial entities set up to look at um, dedicated estates and tree planting schemes and offsets from that, um, large, um, large estates, we do a lot of work with oxygen conservation in terms of um, looking at land and, uh, and, and and conserving that. And I'm also um, a trustee of the Avon Wildlife Trust uh, down here based in Bristol. And so we've just participated in the Avon catchment market area um, uh, and so have been involved in that and seen that, I guess, from the other side in the sense that I was looking at it as a trustee from a a legal perspective, but I was looking at it practically as well and taking the learnings from that. And our philosophy at Burgess Salmon on the net zero side is really to pull together the sectors uh, that we are really well known for in the in, in the UK, which is um, transport, built environment, um, energy in terms of um, uh, clean energy. Um, but then very importantly, uh, many of you who are involved in the States will know Burgess Salmon because historically for over 150 years, we've been really well known as the as the leading firm on, on agriculture, states, farming and so forth. And that is um, the area which really overlaps with what, what we do here. Um, and our philosophy is to make everyone in those sectors work together to achieve net zero and say to people that if you're operating in one sector, don't be blinkered. Um, you need to look up. You need to understand what you're doing in your sector and initiatives you put on, you put in, in your sector work with the other sectors and are desirable and are going to work practically. And there's any amount of examples in the past where with the best will in the world, the best ideas have come forward, but they're not going to work because actually people hadn't foreseen that that's not actually how it's going to work with another sector or they don't need that. And I think that's quite important. Um very briefly by way of intro then when i guess we can get on to some questions my experience of these types of um uh, of uh schemes and contracts they're very varied uh, incredibly um varied um i would say from a legal perspective one thing that's really important to understand for anyone entering that if you're not a lawyer is the entire credibility well that's not fair a large amount of the credibility of your scheme uh, and your schemes going forward and for this market generally is going to be governed and will depend slightly uh, on the legal contracts and the legal mechanisms that are put in place. So um, it's easy for me to say, isn't it? But um, not getting that right, skimping on it is not going to serve you well later down the line. And particularly if you're looking at commercial entities who are engaging in this and are looking to buy credits and source credits, they are looking for credibility. Um, and I think that's very important because I've seen any amount of in the early days, tree planting schemes and various others done on a wing and a prayer with uh, appalling contracts that don't, that don't have any sort of uh, proper legal analysis, don't re cannot really be enforced. Uh, and, and actually that's not going to serve uh, any of us, uh, any of us. Well, we had scandals um, 15, um, 20 years ago in relation to carbon trading uh, and we need to recover from that and uh, and, and take that forward um, we we are in a state and I think both previous speakers have mentioned that this is all in development and we've got to understand that and therefore um, it's all about at the moment allocating the risks 
to each party in a, in, in a fair way. But the reality on that is that's going to change over time. And what I'm certainly seeing in all of these um, uh, these schemes, uh, and they're all different and they're all slightly designed differently, is there's clearly a collective will on the part of all the parties, including the people buying the credits, to understand that it is a voluntary scheme and that it's in the test phase. And, and therefore, there's probably uh, more of a willingness to take on some risks, to realise that you're not going to get a perfect situation in all cases at this particular moment. But we've also got to understand that's going to change and that will change very quickly because at, one, at some point, someone's going to turn around and say, if I am buying these credits, I have to rely on these credits. They have to be properly enforced. And if I find that these credits that I've got are not what they say they are and are not achieving what I'm going to do, I'm not going to be happy. I move beyond the phase of the trial phase and I'm going to want to come against someone for that. Uh, as a commercial organization, if I've paid money for it, I expect to get what I'm getting. So that attitude, I think, over the next decade would harden um, uh, quite quickly. Um, at the moment, there's this element of pragmatism, and there has to be. Uh, and that includes um, lawyers uh, being pragmatic about the fact that not every risk can be covered off just at, at this stage. The reality of these schemes are that they're not easy because you're dealing with multiple parties. You've got landowners traders, agents, contractors uh, to the landowner, purchasers of the credits, verifiers, local authorities. And what you've got to work out is how the contracts sit, who the contracts are with, how they all work together. And I think it was Sarah also mentioned the payment flows. Who are the payments going to, from, how, what happens if the payment gets blocked at some stage or is held onto and doesn't, and doesn't flow through? What are, what are the consequences? And um, I think that... The fundamental message I come back to is that you know, people lose sight of the fact in all of the contractual matrices and all of the uh, all, all of the goodwill about making sure that these things happen. That, that fundamentally, someone is paying or is going to be paying money for something. And um, from a legal perspective, the job of a lawyer is always to ask, well, what what if what if and push. What, what are sometimes uncomfortable questions in a developing market when there is a lot of goodwill between the parties is to say, well, hang on a minute, what happens if this, if this happens, if someone doesn't deliver? Because ultimately that buyer or the landowner expecting to get paid for the scheme that they put in place or reimbursed for the scheme they put in place, what happens if that doesn't happen and there's a default? Who is going to pick up the pieces? Who's on the hook for this? Um, I think that's that, that's an important thing to remember. I just wanted to uh, overlay everything with what I've said with probably even e e even more uh, issues, which mean that this is it's an interesting area and it's challenging, but there's way through. They are long term arrangements. Glenn's mentioned that. And by their very nature of being long term arrangement, that makes often makes the contracts more complicated. It does mean, as we've as we've examined, that land can be sold. It can be inherited. It can change hands. What does that mean? Payment flows we've talked about. I think Sarah said that nature doesn't play ball all the time. OK, so we can have all these legal contracts and the what ifs. But what happens if nature doesn't play ball through no one's fault? What's the situation? At the moment, this is an unregulated market, but we can put forward and project that it will become regulated. That's probably inevitable. And we're also selling, in most cases here, uncrystallized things. So we're selling futures, if you like. Uh, we're selling the prospect of getting um, uh, you know, a, a unit providing it's verified later down the line. And money is changing hands on that basis. And that makes things slightly more challenging about when title passes, payments ahead of actually getting the benefit what if the benefit doesn't accrue all of those things and um, I think we've all mentioned this we all know the reality is the standards are going to change they will change it's absolutely that's what's going to happen and so with all of these uh, models with all of the contracts uh, you have to build in that ability to say well okay what happens when the standards change what's the position how's it going to work how are we going to get together to solve this so those are, uh, uh, I guess, my opening comments um, from a from a legal perspective, and uh, we'll move to questions. Fantastic, Ross. That was a really, really good way to frame up the entire topic. I think uh, the number one takeaway for me is that uh, strength of contracts, and that's a term, by the way, used by investors and bankers, and people talk about strength of contracts a lot when they're considering what they're going to put into a project. 
the strength of those contracts depends a lot on asking the what if. So ask yourself what if on any number of scenarios. Make sure that you've got as clear a view of po as possible of what will happen to your project and all the stakeholders should a scenario arise. Um, so I think that's a really good way to uh, close off the, the panel discussion and move on to questions, which I understand there are quite a few of. So thank you. Oh, we've we, Sarah, thank you. You've been answering a lot of the questions in the chat, but uh, would it be worth going over some of these just for the recording? Um, and so I'll kick off the first one, which was for Sarah. How do you deal with flexibility and the pause and people wanting to leave the agreement? Could you expand a little bit more on your answer? Yes. Um, so I'll come to the leaving the agreement first because this was quite a head scratcher for us um, that we had to work through carefully because, of course, once you're once you've kicked off a project, you're essentially um, obligated to to uh, manage the project in line with it with the agreement ultimately for the delivery of carbon units that are being sold to uh, to approved buyers in our in our scheme. Um, so termination is subject to um, depending on when you leave how many units you've sold um, you need to continue to maintain the project um, to be able to maintain those sold units um, what you can do is stop any future sale so uh, you, you may have sold a proportion of units um, and you'd be obligated to then maintain those so it's about specifically um, agreeing the termination um, clause in line with with the product that you're selling to make sure that the sale um, and the integrity of those units is maintained into the future so what what will happen is basically just a reduction um, from what is agreed um, in the delivery of units um, according to what you've sale at the point of the termination of the agreement so it will always um, carry on um, it's just it's just about how how much uh, sort of allocated units you you commit to um, around the time of termination and the change clauses I think Ross could probably talk more uh, <laughs> more uh, um, uh, specifically than, than myself but we just wanted to make sure again that conversations to make any changes were facilitated we didn't want it to be sort of a, a barrier um, so it, it we we put lots of reasonable language around uh, being able to facilitate enter into discussions about any changes um, or if things aren't quite going to plan it's to do exploration um, and investigations around why and to reevaluate and reform the project um, using our tools to see the impact on the carbon units um, against what's been sold etc so yeah it's just about um, evaluating the impact of the project is it still viable um, if so what changes do we need to make on the sales side of things so it's just making sure that you've got that continuity from the management agreement through to the kind of product and, and commercial elements of, of the scheme wonderful thank you sarah uh so next question uh, i'm really just picking these out of the chat to be honest because i know that a lot of people are commenting and responding to each other which is great to see but there's a good one from anna here that talks about uh, conservation covenants that exist in Scotland, and they've existed for a number of years. Uh, is there any learning from over the border? And I think I think someone down uh, down the chat uh, clarifies these are called conservation burdens uh, and conservation and climate change burdens. Sorry, and so uh, maybe a question for Ross in that: uh, What kind of learnings can we see from other countries, especially Scotland, that has had conservation burdens for a number of years? Well, I'm sure there are, but I'm not a real estate lawyer and I know my Scottish real estate colleagues and, uh, and and English ones have been looking at that because we've been looking at the conservation covenants and consultations that have been coming out. So I can't I can't tell you what the learnings are, but I'm absolutely sure sure there are because I know they've been talking to each other about it. But... Brilliant. No, that's a really good thing just to know that people are talking about it and exchanging information on what works best. I think that's very reassuring for everyone to hear. Um, um, just, just, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. No, I, I was just going to come back but, um, on the on the change the change point. I think uh, that Sarah mentioned because w when you talk about changes, um, you, we need to be slightly careful about that because 
any contract to be valuable uh, to, 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 to be valid needs to be enforceable and certain. And what you can't have is just everyone getting together all the time and just saying, we need to change it, we need to change it, unless you get complete agreement. And I think when we talk about change clauses, you, you need to define what you're prepared to get together to talk about where, if something changes. Are we talking about any change, changing in the scheme? Are we talking about a change in uh, policy and regulation that comes out after the event? Are we talking about a change in actual legal standards or official standards and those types of things? So I would be saying, well, what is that change that is going to bring the parties together? Um, and from that process, then you decide how and how often you're entitling people to get together to work through and change change the contract. There's probably going to be more of that going on in these early contracts than there will be later on, because typically in a legal contract, um, the amount of times you can get together justifiably in the contract and work through a change is relatively limited. It's only if the legal standards change or people will define it down. Uh, and I think people have got to realize that you know, if you are if you're entering into these agreements and it's one of the things that I do point out to landowners, Glenn will know. I mean, you, you're binding yourself, you know, and you're binding and you're binding the land. And I think that's potentially just at the moment dare I say it, one of the potential barriers, because I think a lot of the landowners, Glenn, you can you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, a lot of the landowners that I'm seeing on the more commercial schemes are looking at it and saying, well, is now the right time to do this? Is now the right time to jump? Uh, should I do it right now? I, I, I probably will do it, but, but am I going to get the best price at the moment? I, I don't understand what entirely I'm going to be obliged to do and I'm very wary about binding all my successes in title forever forever and a day yeah I think that's a good point I think also the, the tax element of that is a big one as well so are you going to lose agricultural property relief business property relief the consultation for that closed a few weeks ago we still have no no view of or new, no sight of what's coming and that's a massive risk and a, for a landowner and a massive barrier to investment and to to people taking these projects up so that's a that's one that's probably been covered before just on the point on conservation covenants you, you know there is there are other options internationally that we can learn from and the us is probably the best example of that so um conservation easements in the us have been around for nearly 50 years um their their conservation system aligns to their tax system where if you enter into one of those conservation easements you will get um, some tax reliefs on your income against your income tax from the US government and that that then kind of funds the responsible body system so it's um you know it it's well it's well documented um the nature conservancy have helped in Wendling Beck and their their lawyers and their legal counsel have helped quite a lot around that legal process and you know I think probably could offer quite a bit of help back to government as well we don't need to reinvent the wheel on all of this no, I think that's a really great, uh, maybe a great natural stopping point, because I, I think that's a, a positive message to finish up with. And uh, I'm just noting all of the great questions in the chat. I'm sorry we've run out of time, but I think that's a testimony to how uh, how useful the panellists have been at generating a discussion. So thank you, Sarah, Glenn and Ross for joining today. And um, just to finish up, uh, once again, this webinar. Oh, sorry, Ross, I can see your on mute yeah i was just going to say there's quite a lot of questions in here that i'm looking at from for me i mean just go just go on our website get my email and ping me ping me a question i'll do my best to answer them if you if you've got outstanding ones i'm sorry we we didn't we didn't get around to them mm, no i was going to say i think it would be really good i can compile all the questions uh based off of the recording and the the chat transcript and uh, maybe we can circulate those around and get some offline answers. But yes, thank you everyone again for uh, signing up and attending and thank you to our amazing panel. Um, this has been a really great webinar to finish the series on and I think it uh, just shows how far this space has come in the year since we started this series. So uh, I'm excited to uh, continue uh, running webinars and, and having interesting discussions with the NERF community. And just to say, we will be uh, the, the GFI will be providing uh, more support to the community of practice as we as we go forward. But um, you know, to cap off, uh, this webinar will be uh, recorded and available very shortly. And I know that a lot of people want to continue this discussion, and so I'm um, hoping to see more of that as we as we go on, and hopefully get a little bit more clarity as this space more moves forward. 
So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.